discussed in previous sections. Climate and weather are the determining factors for where different species of trees and whether or not even a forest can exist across a landscape. The Northern Rockies, because of their topography that intercepts weather patterns moving from a west to east fashion, creates a unique scenario where precipitation and water and weather is influenced by the mountains, which in turn influence forests, how they grow and where they occur. With such weather patterns also comes a certain degree of other disturbances, hail, wind, and lightning. On August 10, 2000, known as Black Sunday because on this day multiple wildfires started across Montana that created some of the largest fire complexes in history, on this single day over 80,000 lightning strikes occurred across Montana alone as depicted by this map that recorded individual lightning strikes across the region. The pattern of these thunderstorms and their movement in a northeast progression really shows where the lightning strikes occurred. On a more localized scale, uh, here showing western Montana on another date, August 8, 2003, here's another map showing more individual lightning strikes in a single day. So with the types of weather patterns and the overall climate of the Northern Rockies, lightning has played a significant role across the last 10,000 years of natural history on these landscapes. And with lightning, of course, comes the possibility of wildfires. Now, most wildfires will occur when we have a dry summer, an early spring, and fine fuels such as grasses and twigs dry out enough so when a lightning strike occurs, it will start these fine fuels on fire. The expansiveness of dry fuels across the landscape will determine how a fire progresses, whether it's just a small ignition, such as this one that started in grass and fine twigs and now is torching out individual trees, to where an individual tree torching out can ignite surrounding tree crowns and create what we call an active crown fire. As you can see in this picture, the energy release from such a fire progression is so enormous that it can start creating its own wind and its own dynamics across the landscape, including what are called fire tornadoes or fire whirls that will cause fire in this type of extreme fashion to move in erratic patterns and to propagate itself across the landscape. Once a crown torches out in a forest from a fire in the right conditions, that fire can spread to surrounding crowns, creating what we call an active crown fire scenario. If the expanse and density of trees and the fuel conditions within those trees is right, an active crown fire can grow very large in size and can become a landscape level event. So much energy is released by these fires that it is difficult or almost impossible to actively try and contain such a fire. And the containment strategies would be to back away to where there is a change in fuel conditions and create a scenario where the fire cannot burn across that. But putting aerial tankers or fire crews anywhere close to this type of energy release uh, not only would be ineffective, it would be extremely dangerous for the fire crews. Now such fires are a normal component historically across landscapes, specifically across certain kinds of landscapes. And there are many different viewpoints on the role that fires whether they're small fires or large fires, play in the natural processes of the modern forested landscape. Certainly, fires of this magnitude can move erratically and they can move fast. And the immediate impact after the fire has moved through can be viewed as a catastrophic or devastating effect. Even though, certainly there are landscapes that have evolved with this type of disturbance and can regenerate quite well from them. Nonetheless, fires of this magnitude can be viewed from many different perspectives, both as bad in the case when you come across animals that were caught by the speed and the intensity of this fire. Here's a small buck that uh, was caught sleeping in its bed by the flaming front that moved across this landscape. 
Here's a uh, rather large black bear that was running as fast as it could to get away from the fire and was overwhelmed. Such images are horrific and are necessary to remind us that these fires are dangerous to life and property, even though they may be natural events across the landscape. On the other hand, fires like this can be viewed as a renewal process to which specific species are adapted and have evolved mechanisms to survive. Uh, here is a lodgepole pine forest that burned and several years later we're seeing ample lodgepole pine regeneration, loop ends, lush grasses that have taken advantage of the rich nutrient loading that occurs after a fire uh, when the fire consumes woody debris and releases the nutrients that are trapped within that woody debris. But not all fires are alike. The role of wildfires across the Northern Rockies is a complex phenomenon in the role of the development of these forest ecosystems. If we go back to our map of the different forest zones across the Northern Rockies that are largely determined by temperature and the amount of rainfall and snowpack that occurs on these ecosystems, from the very dry Ponderosa Pine Zone that starts to exist uh, in grasslands where 16 to 18 inches of annual precipitation fall all the way across to the slightly wetter Douglas fir zone, the high snowpacks of alpine fir, the higher rainfall grand fir zone, to the wettest forest type cedar hemlock that can on an average annual year get 30 to 40 inches of rainfall per year. Fire doesn't always play the same role and historically has not played the same role here. So the hotter drier sites such as the Ponderosa pine zone on the average summer are dry enough to support a fire. And therefore historically when a lightning storm went through, it quite often would ignite a fire that would burn through this landscape. And so the frequent low severity fire zone is identified as a forest ecosystem that historically experienced a fire every 1 to 15 years. In this process, because the fire burns so frequently, fuels don't build up. And therefore, this fire tends to stay on the soil surface and act more as a nutrient recycling process where in these dry systems woody debris, uh, cast off needles, twigs, branches, even dead trees decompose at a very slow rate and therefore hold on to all their nutrients. Such fires will break them down and release these nutrients. And at the same time these fires tend to kill the more shade tolerant species that are trying to invade underneath the pioneer species. And with frequent fires, forests such as this 500-year-old Ponderosa pine forest can develop because the frequent fire keeps the encroachment of the more shade-tolerant species out, maintains a more open forest system, and a process where nutrients are relatively quickly recycled and made available back to the trees. The next wettest forest type and the most common forest type across Montana, which includes the Douglas fir, Grand fir, and subalpine fir zones, would be considered a mixed severity fire. It's mixed severity because fire behavior across these landscapes vary tremendously depending on the climatic variability as demonstrated in previous chapters with the diagram of Pacific Decadal Oscillation, whether we were in a dry cycle or a wet cycle, fire would behave differently in accordance to this. And thus, if we look across these types of ecosystems, individual trees might torch out versus burning in the understory like the frequent fire system, and they may spread to small patches, creating a mosaic across the landscape. So here we not only have the example of fire behavior, but the tree structure, the mixture of big old trees surrounded by patches of smaller trees, shows that historically the same type of patchy fire occurred across the landscape where in certain areas it took out all the trees opening up space for younger trees to move in and in other places it burned in the understory maintaining more of an open forest structure creating a patchy landscape and by definition such a mixed severity fire regime uh, would occur where anywhere from 20 percent of a landscape might burn in stand replacing patches to uh, landscapes where even larger patches might burn in standard placing fires. Although the mixed severity fire type was probably the largest landscape fire phenomenon across the northern Rockies, 
Severe landscape level fires also played an important role. And these severe fires, often referred to as the infrequent high severity fire type, occurred mainly on the wetter forest ecosystems across the northern Rockies. North Idaho and northwest Montana that fall in the Grand Fur and Cedar Hemlock forest ecosystems, because of the abundant rainfall they receive, played an important role in this infrequent high severity type. Because of either high snowpacks or high rainfall, on the average year, a lightning strike would not create a fire on these ecosystems. Also, because of the abundant moisture, tree growth and vegetation growth was much higher, thus fuel accumulations occurred fairly rapidly across these sites. Thus, when a dry climatic period occurred, particularly a dry period that lasted several decades, the denser forests, the larger fuel accumulations would dry out, and when an ignition occurred and the fuel conditions were right, these fires were not only extreme in the amount of energy they released because of the fuel accumulation, they were often also larger landscape level events. This picture shows the moose fire that occurred north of Kalispell during an exceptionally dry summer. At first appearance, this might seem to be a catastrophic event from which the forest will never recover. Both the texture of the forest and examination of the tree species shows that this was a lodgepole pine ecosystem that is particularly adapted to standard placing fires just like the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and portions of the divide between Idaho and Montana that burned in the 1910 fires where over 3 million acres burned within three weeks. This fire fell within the historic range of variability. In other words, these types of large landscape standard placing fire events were not uncommon across these portions of the northern Rockies forest ecosystems. And although this picture shows a larger landscape low event, such standard placing fires can be noticed across the northern Rockies, particularly in the higher elevation or the wetter forest ecosystems. Here the larger patches of fine textured forest are lodgepole pine with islands of Douglas fir left from the previous fire that occurred on this landscape approximately 100 years ago. Similarly, on this landscape, larger patches were the standard placing fires where the surrounding forest is Grand Fir, Douglas Fir, and Larch, where Larch here gains the advantage to, of recolonizing these sites. If we take a long-term perspective, say the last 10,000 years of relatively stable climate across the northern Rockies, and the variability that occurred within that period of time, there were centuries where hotter, drier conditions supported frequent fires across most of these landscapes, and cooler wetter periods, such as the last 800 years of the mini ice age, where fires may not have played as big a role across the landscapes. The role of fire, although important in the development of the forest types as we know them today, has varied so much that it would be a mistake to assume that forests will cease to exist without fire. Without fire, they will change in their character, in their species composition, and perhaps in their role across the ecosystem, but they will not cease to exist. The interaction of topography, climatic variability, multiple species, and the role of wildfire is part of what has made the Northern Rockies forest ecosystems unique, and also which has created different habitat for the wide diversity of animal and plant species we have across this region. Thus, any landscape at any given time may have either been a meadow just being colonized by pioneer tree species or at a late successional stage where the pioneer tree species were now being crowded by the more shade tolerant tree species, which typically resulted in a mosaic of different age classes and tree species across any given landscape. During this past century, as shown in previous sections, we not only experienced a role that humans played in suppressing wildfires, a major disturbance process, but also a role that Native Americans played in burning across the landscape, and one of the longest cool wet periods of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. 
the combined impact of these different changes across the landscape has resulted in not only some of the most expansive forests, but the most homogenization of forest ecosystems across landscapes. As in this slide, you can make out the older tree stands that survived previous fires, but they are now becoming very close in density to the younger forests that, that developed after the last fires. So the past century might be marked by a lack of the disturbances that historically may have played a very important role in diversifying tree species and patches of trees across the landscape. This has resulted in perhaps a larger landscape of trees and forest stands that are in the later stages of forest succession. In other words, large landscapes of overcrowded trees that in the past two decades of drier climatic period have become overly stressed. And because of this moisture stress, these trees are now less able to defend themselves against pests and pathogens that are finding abundant food sources that allow them to grow into epidemic proportions, such as this mountain pine beetle outbreak pictured here across a vast expanse of lodgepole pine. These types of pest epidemics can develop very rapidly. In this case, old mature Douglas fir, which is highly susceptible to Douglas fir bark beetle, in one year can be overwhelmed by Douglas fir beetle, creating now an abundance of dead trees and also thereby fuels for potential wildfires to occur. And in such matrices of fuels, and as they accumulate across larger stretches of the landscape and persist because decomposition is so slow, what may be happening is that larger proportions of the landscape are now prone to landscape level crown fires than historically may have occurred. Again, this is a difficult phenomenon to say with any certainty, given that historically our climate varied a lot. And so that we may have seen this phenomenon before recorded history, but at that time these landscapes did not have to support the realm of ecosystem services that are important to a more human populated landscape of today. And so the real question is not whether or not these forests will survive or whether they disappear or not, it is the role that these forests play to us, the human population that lives within these landscapes. How much water do they produce? What is the wildlife habitat that's available across these landscapes? <music>